Yeah, Professor Mohit, now we can start, please. Uh, thank you, sir. A uh, very good afternoon. Uh, I am Mohit, and uh, along with uh, along with me is Professor Basant Yadav from the Department of Water Resources Development Management. I hope everyone is doing uh, and keeping up well. I uh, welcome you all to the third in Ocean Memorial Lecture organized by the Department of Water Resources Development Management, IIT Roorkee. Today we have with us Professor Asit K. Biswas, who will be delivering an exciting lecture on moving India's water management from unsustainable to sustainable path, opportunities and challenges. I welcome you, sir, to this event. I also welcome Professor Ajit Kumar Chattavedi, the Director, IIT Roorkee, Professor Ashish Pandey, Head Department of Water Resource Development Management, Professor ML Kansal, Professor Deepak Khare, Professor Basant Yadav, all the faculty members and all attendees. Before you start this lecture, I would like to inform you and all the attendees to post their questions, if any, in the chat box. We'll take all of them during the end of the lecture. Now, may I please request Professor Ashish Pandey to say a few words about the end Kosla Memorial Lecture. Please, please. Thank you, Professor Mohit. It's a matter of great pleasure to us that Professor Asit K. Biswas is with us to have this uh, third AN Kosala lecture. It's my proud privilege to tell something about uh, Dr. AN Kosala. Engineer Ajudhya Nath Kosala, born on 11th December 1892, was an eminent Indian engineer and politician. Dr. Kosala worked as Vice Chancellor of the University of Rurki from 1954 to 1959. He was awarded the Padma Bhusan in 1954 and the Padma Vibhusan in 1977. He was nominated as member of the Raj Sabha in 1958, but later in 1959 resigned to join the Planning Commission of India. He was the 11th governor of Orisha during 1962 to 1968. Born in Jalandhar, district of Punjab, he took up his early education in Punjab and obtained the BA with honours from BAV College, Lahore in 1912. He then joined the Thompson College of Civil Engineering in 1913 and graduated in 1916 as a civil engineer. After graduation in 1916, he started his career with the irrigation branch of the public, Punjab Public Works Department in 1990 when the Indian Service of Engineers was established. He was assigned his first assignment for surveys and investigation of Bhakra Dam project. He spent 18 months on deputation to Mesopotamia as a commissioned officer. During this period, he developed the Khosla disk for precision labeling across rivers and wide valleys. In 1931, engineer Khosla was deputed to the U.S. and Europe to study soil reclamation, water logging and the latest techniques in dam design. In 1936, he wrote his magnum output, the design of B.S. on permeable foundation. This publication revolutionized the design of such structures in India and abroad. As an engineer, engineer Khosla served at following prestige position. He was appointed as the first chairman of the newly constituted Central Waterways Irrigation and Navigation Commission, now known as Central Water Commission, in 1945. He established the Central Water and Power Station at Khadak Basla, earlier known as Pune Research Station. He was instrumental in the construction of Bhakra Dam and later served as chairman of the board of consultants of Bhakra Control Board until its commissioning in 1963. He undertook planning, design and construction of Hirakud Dam, a major water resource project in India. He was the president of Indian National Science Academy during 1961-62. He was instrumental in bringing about a number of agreements on negotiation for Indus water disputes with Pakistan. As educationist, he was the first Indian Vice Chancellor of the Thompson College of Civil Engineering, later renamed as University of Rurki and now the IIT Rurki. He was the founder of two specialized Indian departments, that is the Water Resource Development Training Center, now WRDM, 
and the School of Research and Training in Earthquake Engineering, which have made the University of Roorkee internationally well known. Recognizing his contribution, the University of Roorkee conferred the honorary DSC degree to him in 1959. He was also awarded DSC degree uh, by Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute USA as well as by the various universities such as the University of Punjab, Sambalpur University, OUT, Bhubaneswar, Jadavpur University and IIT Delhi. Government of India recognized his contributions and awarded the most prestigious Shanti Sarup Bhatmagar Prize in 1974. IIT Rurki has named one of the guest houses in his memory as Khosla International House and constituted Dr. A. N. Khosla Award, which is well known to all of us. IIT Bhubaneswar has also named one of its hostels as Ian Khosla Hall of Residence. He completed his life in 1984. The Department of WRDM feels proud in initiating the Anon Khosla Endowment Lecture Series in his memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandey, for providing a very detailed highlight of Ian Khosla and also the Ian Khosla Memorial Lecture Series. Now we request Professor ML Kansal to please welcome Professor Asit K. Biswas, the speaker for this uh, lecture series. Good evening, uh, everybody. It is my proud privilege to introduce uh, Professor Asit K. Biswas, who is Distinguished Visiting Professor, University of Glasgow, UK, Director, Water Management, uh, International Singapore, and Chief Executive, Third World Center for Water Management, Mexico. Professor Biswas is universally acknowledged as one of the world's leading authorities on water, food, environment, and development related issues. He has a distinguished career as an academician, senior public official, advisor, and confidant to, to presidents, prime ministers, and ministers in 23 countries, six heads of United Nations agencies, two secretary generals of OECD, several heads of bilateral aid agencies, and four CEOs or chairmen of MNCs in Fortune 500 list. Professor Biswas has worked and lived in almost all continents of the world. He was a member of the World Commission on Water and co-founder of International Water Resources Association and World Water Council. Professor Biswas was a member of the Global Agenda Council of the World Economic Forum and is currently member of the International Advisory Board PICTEC Asset Management Geneva, member of the advisory board IIT Khadakpur, and strategic advisor Singapore International Water Week. Among his numerous awards are the Crystal Grove and Millennium Prizes of the International Water Resources Association, Walter Hoover Prize of the American Society of Civil Engineering, Stockholm Water Prize, considered to be the Nobel Prize for Water for his outstanding and multifaceted contributions to Global Water Resource Issues, Person of the Year Award from the Prime Minister Harper of Canada, Aragon Environment Prize of Spain, Routers named him as one of the top 10 water uh, trailblazers of the world, Impeller Magazine selected him as a two global water hero. Because of his many uh, manifold research contributions, he has received seven honorary Doctor of Technology uh, from the leading global universities including from both University of Glasgow and University of Strathclyde. He was elected an academician over 20 years ago. He currently has an H index of 46, Global Scholar list 950 of his publications and over 10,400 citations of his work. He has a research gate score of 42.1, which puts him into top 2.5% of all scientists from all disciplines from the entire world. He is author or editor of 89 books. His work has been translated into 42 languages. Professor Biswas is the founder of the International Journal of Water Resources Development and was its editor-in-chief for its first 29 years. He is regular media contributor to BBC, CNN, CNBC, TRT, Project Syndicate, uh, Syndicate, the Conversation, Channel News Asia, Media Corps, and China Daily, on issues related to natural resource management, climate change, environment, geopolitics, international relations, business strategies, and innovations. His opinion 
pieces in various international media are now read by uh, some 1.74 million readers annually are over the world we are very proud of having him with us today for this prestigious lecture i welcome you sir thank you very much professor kanso uh, one of the thing i'm really proud of is the fact i was there when the indian water resources society was created at the university of roorkee i don't know decades ago and uh, i was elected one of the first honorary members of iwrs and that is it that is still one of my singular honors so i'm very pleased uh, to be with you today and uh, speak about india's water management uh, it's a privilege pleasure and honor to be a speaker at the khosla memorial lecture dr khosla was a legend of my gener legend legendary engineer politician of my generation my one of my regret is i never had the personality to meet him in person even though i heard him in lecture but i never met him in person but i i had an opportunity to meet some of his contemporaries like dr kl rao who later became indian minister of water the topic i want to address today is india's water management first of all let me say that in order that we can solve the problem first we have to recognize what is the magnitude extent and nature of the problem and this is where i would like to start with dr khosla was a plain speaking engineer who based all based all his statements and papers on facts and evidence and i have tried to be follow his example and be as factual and as evidence based in first reviewing india's current water management practices and see what the problems are and how this can be solved the fact is india's water management has been on an unsest unsustainable path for centuries in fact those of you who know history will remember that in in 1600 akbar the great the most famous mughal emperor wanted to build a new capital he wanted to move from delhi and build a new capital so the place he selected was fatehpur sikri and the best indian architect artisans were brought to make fatehpur sikri a reality but akbar stayed in fatehpur sikri only for 13 years because he had to return to delhi since one of the main item for survival in a very arid area like fatehpur sikri was water the fatehpur sikri simply ran out of water and so akbar had to return to delhi and in his heyday when fatehpur sikri was the capital of india and fatehpur sikri means those of you know means the city of victory the the english merchant scholar robert fitch wrote about fatehpur sikri and agra in his in his book and he mentions that he compared fatehpur sikri and agra to london and he notes that both of these cities agra and fatehpur sikri are more prosperous and more populous than london at that time but few years later fatehpur sikri was no more it is still listed it is still it is listed now as a unesco heritage site because of its remarkable contribution architectural contribution but as a city 
it disappeared because of the lack of water. And this is just one example of the unsustainability of India's water management that the capital had to be abandoned in the 17th century because of not given enough emphasis on water. Fast forward a few hundred years, and one of my early mentors in India was a remarkable lady. I had the privilege of knowing former prime, late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. She was a re remarkable mentor and a friend. And I remember one meeting in early 1980s, we changed my, my mindset completely. I was at that time Director General of Environment Canada in Ottawa, and I was in India for some reason, and naturally I went to see her, and we had tea together. And after half an hour, she looked as a kindly mother or a grandmother to me and said, was it for you? It seems the sun and the moon revolves around water. You are all excited about water. But as a prime minister, I have no interest in water. I was very surprised. I said, Prime Minister, how is it possible that you have absolutely no interest in water? Without water, we cannot live. A human being cannot live. We cannot produce food. We cannot produce energy, blah, blah, blah. The usual speech we, we water people give to the politicians saying the water is very important. And what she said completely revolutionized my mindset. She said, look, as a prime minister, I'm interested only in the end, not the means. And I asked her, what does he mean by that? And the Prime Minister Indiraji told me that if you want to talk about water, I can ask my staff to make an appointment for you to see the Water Minister or the Chairman of the Central Water Commission. And believe me, if my staff makes the appointment, you will get red carpet treatment for them. And you can talk to them to your heart's content about water. But I'm not interested. So I asked her, what are you interested, Prime Minister? He said, she said, as a Prime Minister, I'm interested in improving the standard of living of my fellow Indians. How do I generate jobs, employment for the Indians so that more people are employed in good paying jobs or they earn a good living? Secondary things like water or energy, they are a means to an end, which means the end being better standard of living of Indians, more jobs, better quality of life. So she said, if you want to talk about water, I'm not the right person. Every time you come to India, come, we'll have tea, we'll talk to each other because I think you have great potential, but Please, we are not going to talk much about water. But then I had this brilliant idea. I said, Prime Minister, if I frame the discussion slightly differently, we start talking about how water could be a catalyst for employment generation, agricultural development, improving the standard of living of the people. He said, well, then you'll be speaking my language. You see, she showed me a talk she was going to give at a major water meeting uh, that week. She said, look, what I have got, what I'm going to speak about. She's, and she read the first paragraph saying that year, what was the hydroelectric potential of hydropower generation in India? And she said, I'll read all these figures. They don't mean nothing to me. I'm going to say so many megawatts of hydropower is generated. I don't know if that many megawatt light one house, 100 house, 1,000 house, or 1 million house. Those are, I, I have no idea. And as a prime minister, I'm not ID. 
I, I'm not interested in that. So from there on, I learned that if you want to get the interest of the politicians, you have to frame the discussions in a different way. How can water act as a catalyst for economic development, regional development, agricultural development, which will generate energy, which will generate employment, which will gen improve the quality of life, standard of living. And that is what the politicians understand and uh, they realize. So from there on, all my life, when I talk with the politicians and the senior people, I try to find out what makes them tick and try to frame the discussion on the areas they're interested in. And this is how, and that statement of Indraji made me reflect and it changed my entire life because I've been framing all my statements now all the, to the politicians when I talk, not on how to improve efficiency of water management, but how water improving water availability, reliability would allow them to win election, which would allow them to stay in power, which is the main objective of the policymakers. So I'd like to suggest to all of you the first thing, one of the things you need to do in the water profession need to do is how to frame the discussion so the water becomes at the top of the water agenda of the state and political agenda of the state and in the union and the center. Let me just give another thing which I'm seeing not only in India, but all over the world. Politicians of all kinds who make our policies become interested in water when there is a flood, heavy flood or a continued drought. The day the flood is over, the drought is over, their interest in water simply evaporates. And water problems cannot be solved with only periodic uh, interest. We have to have time to plan, implement, and it takes time from the, if you're constructing a large dam and irrigation project, it will probably 20 years by the time they are implemented and come planned, implemented, and uh, it's become operational. So we need strong attention from the policymakers for a prolonged period of time. And most part of the world, they don't have that interest. And let me give you just one example. About three years ago, one chief minister of one of the major Indian provinces called me suddenly. I don't know him, uh, but uh, he called me suddenly, said that we understand that he said he understands that uh, I have a great knowledge of water and the state is having a major drought. And could I please come immediately and uh, give him some advice how to solve it. And I told the chief minister, it was a telephone call. I told the chief minister, look, my timetable is all booked for the next three to four weeks. I cannot come immediately, but if you are interested and you fulfill certain conditions, then I'll be happy to come as soon as possible. And please give me the number I can call and I'll let you know when I'd be able to come. So the following day, I looked at my timetable and I said, in about four weeks time, I'd be able to come, but then I want to make sure he would be available. One of the problems I find working in India is if you make appointments with most chief ministers or ministers, the time is very flexible. Uh, they said they'll meet you one day, you go there, and then when you arrive there, they said the meeting has been postponed a few hours later or even the next day. I said, I cannot do that. We, you'll have to agree to find some time and, and promise me that you'll be available. He agreed to all those conditions, but when I sent him an email to the, to the email he sent, the email address he gave me, I received no answer. 10 days later, I called his office and asked, have you received as the chief minister received his email? And his private secretary told me that yes, and he's been trying to get a time for the meeting, 
from the from the chief minister for the uh, so that they they can let me know when we can meet and have all the discussions but he has not been able to get any time from him and then with a smile he said sir it has been raining quite a bit and water is not in the top priority in his agenda. To cut a long story short, I never heard from him, even though day after I spoke, he put out a news release saying one of the world's leading water experts is coming to the state to solve the problem. But we never met, we never had an agreement, and because it started raining, he had no interest. So the question is, how do we keep our politicians interested in water and do things that are necessary. My thesis is very simple. India has excellent expertise in terms of water. It has money. People who say we don't have money, that's nonsense. What we don't have, and I don't see any, any sign of, uh, any significant sign of happening this, both at the center, centers, things are moving, but in most of the states at present, that our politicians are that interested in water. Fortunately, I see now major emphasis with, uh, on the current government on many of the water-related issues, and things are improving, but not to the extent that can be done. And many of the things we are doing now, I would like to submit to you, are going to create long-term serious problems. So we need to rethink what we need to do. So let me just start with three types of water use that is most prevalent in India. First, domestic water use. Second, agriculture. Third, industry. Now, in my view, there is absolutely no reason why everyone in India, at least in the urban centers of India, any cities more than say 200,000 people, two lakhs people, cannot have a sustainable drinking water supply on a 24 by 7 basis, which can be drunk by drunk straight from the tap. Absolutely no reason. We have the technical expertise, we have the engineering expertise, we have the management expertise, and we have the funds. What, however, we miss is the political system and the institutional system which does not allow us to do what is necessary. Let me give you some example. I have been advising Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority in Cambodia. Now, most people may have heard of Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority, which provides water supply to the city of Phnom Penh. In 1993, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority was broke, li literally bankrupt. People who are receiving, if they are lucky, two to three hours of water of unknown quality every day. It was not functional at all. And what happened in 1993 was they brought in, for whatever reason, a gentleman called Exxon Chan as the Director General of Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority. He spent the first year, he, knows not, he knew nothing about water. He was a mechanical engineer, not, knew nothing about water. First year, he spent his time looking into how he could provide good quality water 24 by 7 basis to the citizens of Phnom Penh. What happened next is really something worth talking about. He realized that at PPWSA, the Phnom Penh Water Authority, at that time lost 73% of water due to unaccounted for losses, 73%. Only 27% were 
were available to the people. So his first thought was, if I can reduce the these losses significantly, that would give, provide him with a great deal of water, which could go to the Nampel inhabitants. Second, he re realized that in order to do that, he must have a reasonably good system where, where the financial model is in the, in the proper way so that PPWSA can run by itself. Because at that time, both Cambodia and Phnom Penh was broke. They had no money. So the government of Cambodia created Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority as an autonomous corporation. And they asked them that there will be no money available. You just sort it out uh, the best to, the authority, best to your capability. So what Exxon Chan did is he started finding out who is receiving the water and did a survey who is receiving the water and paying the bills. And he found out that 28% of the people who are paying the bills don't even have even connection to the grid. So they are paying bill, they are happy to pay a bill for which they don't get any services or any water. And when he tried to find out why, it was very clear because it was so little that every citizen of Phnom Penh, in order to prove their address, they needed an electricity bill and a water bill to show that they live in a place. So they are quite happy to pay for a non-existent service because the bill was peanuts. So he started then developing a system to find out who has the water, who are being given, provided access to water, and develop a system, information system, where he can get all the information and all the houses and the flats were metered. Uh, and so within 10 years, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority brought down their losses to about 12%. And when I started working with them. They knew if you ask them what was the income, what was yesterday, the amount of money that PPWSA received from the, their customers, their system was so good, you could just press a button and automatically get this was their cash flow yesterday. They now have a system that is, you'll be surprised to hear, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority now provides water 24 by 7 to a ever-expanding population because this is the one of the few water utilities that work. And one of the things politicians have done is to increase the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority's area they serve steadily each year. So it has continually increased. And everyone within this area is getting 24 by 7 water, which could be drunk from the tap. If you go to Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority, you won't find a single staff member who has a plastic bottle drinking from a plastic bottle. They all drink from the tap. And what is interesting is everybody pays for water. The rich, the middle class, the poor pay for water. The poor are subsidized direct subsidy, and Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority do not get a single cent from the Phnom Penh municipality or the Cambodian government. And from about 1998, it has been making a profit each year, and the profit has been steadily increasing up to about 2017. And by increasing efficiency, they have managed to do, do all that. To the extent now, Nom, if you look at the performance indicator of Phnom Penh, it is now better than London, better than Paris, better than Los Angeles. So my question to you is if Phnom Penh, where they do not have the 
even a fraction of the technical and managerial expertise as any big cities in India, like Delhi, Chennai, or Mumbai has, can solve its water problem within six to seven years, and now become one of the best in the world, not only in the developing country, one of the best in the world, why can't Delhi or Chennai solve its water problem? I would submit to you, if the government accepts one simple suggestions I have, one simple administrative suggestion I have, it will immediately solve 70% of Delhi's or Chennai's or Mumbai's water problem without any extra effort. A simple administrative effort. And what is that? Unfortunately, in engineering professions, we don't think beyond technical issues. And this is what one of the things I would like to leave with you. We have to look at the water supply, domestic agriculture, more than from technical viewpoint. The major bottleneck in the cities, major cities of India, is how they're managed. If you look at Delhi John Wood, the average stay of the chief executive of Delhi John Wood is 18 months, one eight months. The average stay of Bangaluru John Wood, municipal chief executive of Gen uh, Bangaluru Jal Board, with more than 12 million people, is, believe it or not, nine months. And the chief executives are all IS officers. They are brilliant. They are good. But once you go and they come from a system with no background of running a water utility, no background in water. They also come with the full realization that if you're in Bangalore, Bangaluru, your stay will be an average of nine months. If you're in Delhi, your stay will be average of 18 months. By the time they start learning about the system, by the time they start planning, not complete planning, but start planning, their time of stay is over and they're transferred to another department. So they don't even bother because they know that there is no incentive or no possibility to solve uh, Delhi's water problem in 18 months. It cannot be done. So if the government of India accepts my recommendations, which I have made to successive prime minister, to change the administrative system of the job boards, that is, find the best person available, headhunt that person, and then provide that person at least a three-year term, which could be renewable, subject to meeting some benchmark. So the chief executive would be well evaluated every month, and depending on the, his, his or her performance, the things could be improved. In Long Pen, Exxon Chan from state running PPWSA from 1993 to about 2012, almost 20 years. His successor stayed 10 years and just a new successor has been appointed. So they have enough time to find, understand the system, plan the system and execute that plan. But with the revolving chair, as we see, I submit to you, neither Delhi, nor Chennai, nor Bangalore, nor Kolkata, we have 24 by 7 clean water supply, irrespective of what they do, unless they change the institutional system. It's not that the IS officer isn't good. In fact, about four years ago, I met the Delhi John Board chief executive, a remarkable guy, who, given that he was left in his position for six years, I had no doubt this gentleman, Keshav Kumar, he would have completely transformed Delhi 
John Moore's water system and Delhi's life. But after 18 months, he was, he was gone. So this is the problem India is facing, not technical expertise, not money, not management expertise, but some of the institutional arrangement which is stopping people to solve the problem. The second question on the domestic water supply is, India has a standard suggestion that person, an average person in a metropolitan area should have at least 130 liters per capita per day. Yet, not a single city in India ever in its entire history has done a study how much water does an Indian citizen that's living in Delhi, or Chennai, or Mumbai, or Kolkata need to lead a productive and a healthy life. Do we need 130 liters? Do we need 200 liters or what? What did this 130 liters per capita per person came to? If you do some, any of you listening to this, do some analysis, you will not find any information because someone sometime thought 130 liters is enough, is good enough to lead a healthy and productive life. I give you one example. In Singapore, between 1965 and 1975, did this analysis: how much water does an average Singaporean live need to live a healthy and productive life? And after 10 years of study, they found out that more than 75 liters, 75 liters, there are no health benefits, no productivity gains at all. The rest are aesthetic gains. So under Singaporean conditions, then 75 liters per capita per day is the one that should be aimed at. And if you look at some of the other parts of the world, big cities like having similar weather conditions as say Delhi or where you are in sitting in Rurki, uh, like in Spain, Mediterranean region of Spain, they are now finding out their daily per capita water needs are below 100 liters per capita per day. Now, if I look at Delhi, what is happening? Instead of everyone paying for paying for water and having some water conservation effect, if you are a Delhiite, assuming you have a five-member household. 130 liters per capita per day is free. You don't pay for it. So there is no incentive for you to save. And if you use more, there is some progressive tariff. But my thesis to, to Indian working on the domestic side, please start looking at some of the fundamental design parameters we are now using, which are completely obsolete and totally unnecessary. We really do not need 130 liters per capita per day to lead a productive life. And it will make a major changes in the performance and the availability of, uh, of what is available. And the people, in my view, our politicians want to make water free because water is a big emotional topic. And they think by making water free, they will get votes and they will stay elected. And I've been telling several chief ministers that if you can show your people that you can provide 24 by 7 water, which can be drunk by the tap, and cheaper for you to pay a little bit more than what you are doing now, because all my friends in Delhi, when I go, and I have not been to Rurki for the last 20 years, so I, I don't know what the situation in Rurki. All my friends in Delhi or Mumbai or Chennai, they have to use an underground tank, overhead tank, a pumping system to provide a, their supply, maybe two, three hours per day, but they have 24 hour water supply of poor quality. So the cost of that and using RO, which all my friends in Delhi uses, which literally use, literally 
waste 70 percent of water because of poor efficiency it's not necessary you can show that if delhi drill board is allowed to provide clean water at a slightly higher rate each household will reduce its current water bill that is the municipal bill plus electricity bill to pump water plus all the facilities to point of use treatment your individual cost will go down by at least one third so the qu my question my suggestion to the chief ministers have been that please go ahead and provide to the people because people don't trust the water they get or the water utility in india anymore try the, try it out for one year or two years show to the people that you, our utilities can provide 24 by 7 clean water once people see perhaps they would be willing to pay a little bit more and the and the politicians will get the votes they need to be elected because they will the first ones to show that they did something for the people so that is on the domestic side the many of the issues are not technical they are institutional and political on which people like you and i technical people have no say we cannot get rid of the is officers we cannot set up a system where we headhunt the best people now let me come to the agricultural water use we have to look how best to use agricultural water how efficiently and here only only water people irrigation engineers have only a, a limited role to play and we need to take a look at examples of how other countries have solved are solving their agricultural water problem and i would like to suggest that we take a look at, at china how they are reducing how, how they're handling the agricultural water management irrigation water requirement and also the farmers lifestyle one of the most interesting things if you go to china you'll find that if you go to some of their major agricultural areas individual farmers own as little land as in india individual holdings are very small but what the chinese people have done and it is something worth looking at is since plots are very small it's very very difficult for them to manage water and many other issues so a couple of the advanced provinces encourage some of the farmers to form a cooperative in an area they could form a cooperative and the, the two i visited two years ago were in the hebe province and they were as large as any large company any large agribusiness company in the us but the land holding belongs to the farmers small what happened is a group of farmers initially got together and they managed to show that with better management they could increase their income from the land the two i saw now consists of few thousand hectares of land managed by an mba hired by the group they decide mbas and the deputies agronomists and others decide what crops to grow when to grow they can buy because they're such a large group they know they can negotiate better prices for fertilizer pesticides they have better agronomists to help them and they have better way of marketing because they're large the few many small farmers who did not join the group the cooperative they found out the lifestyle of their colleagues have improved very very significantly once they saw all of them to have all of them decided voluntarily to join the cooperative and it is worth seeing because they are not only looking at the income maximization with which came water use efficiency better seeds better negotiations 
with the seeds, uh, with, with the seeds provider, and better marketing. So we have to see: can we accept the Chinese way? What they have done It's nothing very special, but can we do something similar to that so that large plots of farm could be put together, consolidated, and managed by bright MBAs, agronomists, engineers, advising them as employees of, of a cooperative. I think it can be done, but it, it needs to do, it has some of these models have to be modified to suit the Indian conditions, but this can be done. And as a result, if you look at China's agricultural water use between 2090 and 2020, it has gone down by 30% overall, and the production has increased very, very significantly. And this is also going to continue in the coming years because their plans are to reduce the water needs because like India, China is also facing water problems and because of climate change, more droughts and more intensive rain, better management. So in the future, I think we have to start thinking outside the box, see how we can get water, land, food system integrated and managed. Uh, and not th this, believe me, is not what Indians and the others are speaking about IWRM, Integrated Water Resources Management, which does not work, has not worked for the last 70 or 80 years. And countries like South Africa and China has already gone completely out of IWRM. And they have actually gone to, to disintegrated water resources management because that is working better. So we need to start in the profession, I would like to suggest we start thinking about how we can solve the problem in a major way, in a transformational way in terms of lack of water, uh, water scarcity, rather than incremental way. And I don't think India has that luxury. When before India was partitioned in 1947, the total population of undivided India was about 390 million people. That included what was what became Indian Pakistan, 390 million. By 2050, in 30 years from time, 30 years from now, that 390 million will become 2.25 billion. Tremendous increase. Add to that rapid urbanization which we are seeing in India very extensively, and it will continue. Rapid industrial growth, and water will become, water is becoming a major, will become, has become a major constraint. And I have no hesitation in confirming our study, which we did about six years ago in our Mexico center, where we predicted in 10 years time, at least 10 Indian cities will run out of water. Major, major urban centers will run out of water. And I think it will be sooner than later. So agriculture is the major user of water. And if you want to manage water properly, we have to look at agricultural side. The third one I want to discuss a little bit more is on the industrial side. I don't know the exact statistics in India, but globally, water requirements of the agricultural sector on a percentage basis has been steadily declining over the last 20 years. A percent, on, a, on a total basis, it has been increasing, but on a percentage basis, agricultural water use has been losing. I suspect it's the same situation in India, but I don't have the facts. Uh, perhaps somebody from CWC can correct me on, on that. But the area where water requirements are increasing tremendously is industrial water requirements. As India industrializes, its water requirements are increasing. And how do we get people in the industry, the ch chief executives of industry, to, uh, to 
understand that water is going to be a critical item for their survival uh, in the coming years. Let me give you some example from India, what some of the leading multinationals are doing, uh, not only in India, but other countries. Uh, unfortunately, people, it is, it's a sad, it's a sad commentary that not a single Indian multinational has ever approached me for advice, but the major multinationals from all over the world ask my advice on water management, climate change, and other environmental issues. The same goes the government. Last 20 years, not a single Indian government has asked me for an advice or has asked me to look at their problems. Yes, they asked for advice in passing, but no serious attempt has been made. So I don't know what the Indian multinationals are doing, but I, share, I want to share with you some of the major multinationals that have factories in India. One of them is Nestle. And we studied Nestle's water requirements in Moga in Punjab. And it is incredible to see what Nestle has done, not only in Moga, but also in other parts of the developed and developing world. As many of you know, one of the main products of Nestle, Nestle is the world's largest food producer, food processor and food, pro food producer, one of the top 500 Fortune 500 companies of the world. I've been advising the chairman of the board and the chief executive of Nestle for a while. Nestle depends on milk as its ingredient. Up until five years ago, most of the milk they buy from the farmers come, used to come to the factory like Moga factory in Punjab and the water was evaporated to make condensed milk, powdered milk, and other milk products. So Nestle's D bench chief executive Peter Brabeck, after following discussions with me, made a policy for Nestle globally. Irrespective of water price in Moga, in terms of technological investment, they, sh they should base what Nestle pays for water in Switzerland. That simple one statement that investment would be on the basis of water price in Beve, their headquarters, and not in Moga, changed the economics. So the water that was used to evaporate in Moga to make milk product. And they started this first actually in Mexico. And what they did is when they used the shadow price of water from Bebe, they found it cheaper to catch the evaporated water from the milk and milk contains 86% water catch it, condense it, treat it. And they found out in Mexico that not only they can have enough water to run the entire factory without any other water sources, but also two years ago, when there was a drought in this area, they sold excess water from milk, milk evaporation to the nearby factory, thus making even money. So they now have six factories already different parts of the world, including California, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, and MOGA is going that way, and China, and where Nestle will not be withdrawing any water from the environment to run their factories. Now, to what extent our other industry can follow this type, I don't know. If we look at Coca-Cola, there, most advanced factories now in Gujarat. Before Coca-Cola needed 2.1 bottles of water 
to manufacture one bottle of Coke, to produce one bottle of Coke. Now they have cut down that in that latest Gujarat factory by using technology, by better management practices to 1.3 liters per bottle of manufacturing. These are significant savings. Uh, Unilever in India is also doing remarkable jobs in water savings, uh, reducing carbon dioxide, et cetera. But I don't know what the Indian industries are doing, both the multinationals or the small scale. But globally, we see now the chief executives of large companies like Nestle or Unilever or Coca-Cola realize if they have to survive and thrive, they have been around for at least 140 years, if they want to survive and thrive for the next 140 years, they have no choice but to improve their very, very significantly their water management practices and think outside the box as Nestle, Coca-Cola, and Unilever are doing. So the solutions are there. We have to think it in a slightly different way. And the message I would like to leave with you, yes, India's water management cannot continue this way, but we have to improve. We have to, last comment I want to make is about the national water management policy of India. We have had three groups, three versions of NWMP. And when, I, when Chetan Pandit and I looked at it, and those of you who don't know Chetan Pandit, he was a member of the Central Water Commission. We looked at it, what has actually happened? We found out all three versions have been wish list. And there are a lot of things that have been gone from one version one to two and three. It's a fourth version, I understand is under preparation, have made no sense, never been implemented, never will be implemented, but still there in the take two, only two, IWRM. NWMP promotes IWRM when all over the world, IWRM, even though in spite of it, UN and the others been pushing for IWRM, our study indicates there has not been a single major or major waterfall, major water project which could be done managed on an IWRM basis based on last 70 years of experience. It cannot be done. And as I mentioned, in India, you know, in China and South Africa, the government have officially jettisoned IWRM. Other things that consistently comes up in the national water management policy is river basin management. It's been proposing RBM right from the 1980s when the first was done. When we look into how many river basin organizations have been put together in the last 30 years, not one. How many are being considered? Not one. And when one of the ministers I talked to about a decade ago about river basin management, he was quite a, he was a very intelligent man. He said, it cannot be done in an Indian context, primarily because IWRM and IRBM are being pushed internationally by few small developed countries, primarily the Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands. It is good for them because they, are, they have the consultants, they have others making IWRF plan all over, which creates employment opportunities for, the, for their consultants. But if you ask what, is, what they are doing in the country, uh, only river basin that has been managed properly is the same river basin, same Normandy river basin. And the only reason that has been managed properly it was because by an error, the French parliament gave the Seine Normandy Basin the power of taxation. They could tax the people and the institute and the industry directly without going through that. Without that, Seine Normandy could, would not 
succeed. And India tried integrated uh, this type of evaluation with the Down the Valley project, which did not turn out to be very well, which was a pale imitation of TVA, but it didn't work out well. In India's case, if you look at a big river like Ganga, it is impossible given all the states having that to manage Ganga even within India from uh, forgetting Bangladesh and Nepal and others to manage integrate on a, uh, on a river basin basin. Even if you look at Jamuna, government of India tried upper splitting Jamuna into two, upper Jamuna and lower Jamuna. And to my last knowledge, that didn't work out at all. And the committee has not met for decades now. So one reason this doesn't work just because they work in small countries in small rivers, which in Indian context, we will call them a nala rather than a river. Uh, Indian rivers are big, monsoons are very serious. We have to start thinking whether IWRM, IRBM, they work in an Indian context. And if they don't work, I do not see why in the academia and also in the Central Water Commission, we pay leaf service to IWRM, IRBM, when we know it do not, it does, these paradigms do not work, will not work at all. So I'd like to leave you with this, that India's water problem is solvable. We can solve it. India has the expertise, both management and administrative. India has the technology, India has the funds. If we can get the political system and the institutional system right, and this is an area what we academics have not given much thought, the political and institutional aspect of water management. That, it, to me, is one of the major lacunas for India's uh, unsustainable water management. And last comment I want to make is the Central Water Commission. When it was developed, it was, it was a remarkable institution. I take my hats off to CWC what is achieved. It should have been reformed, strengthened about 15, in my view, 15, 20 years ago. But the idea, my thesis is, don't throw the baby with the bathwater just because CWC's mandate is very different than when it was created to now, when the states have now considerable expertise. What does CWC need in the second quarter of the 21st century? So those type of, instead of going on hobby horses, how do we amend CWC so that it becomes a leading force for sustainable water development in the second quarter of the 21st century? CWC has some wonderful people, very good people, but I'm afraid it needs to be revamped, reorganized. Its objectives have to be changed, but this is for something to do that. And unless we move ourselves from an unsustainable to sustainable path, and we have a small window, because I'm convinced that if we continue this way, within the next 10 years, by 2030, before 2030, one of the major Indian cities, as we saw, in, will be hit with another variety of disease. Uh, it may not be COVID, but it be some, something else. It could be existing once, call it a typhoid, because of poor water quality. And that's one of the biggest problems India is facing, all the water quality within the cities and around the cities are heavily polluted. And all the, the toilet construction program, as you see in many parts, is a step in the good directions. But we have to start thinking. Even the US cannot handle septic tanks properly. What reason do you have when you are building millions of septic tanks without, without having any clear idea how to get rid of the waste from the septic tanks. I saw in Patna what is happening. There are no rules and regulations. There are small suction pumps that are coming, taking the sludge out from the septic tanks, dumping it wherever, 
empty land they find, and that eventually ends up in the Ganga after, after runoff. So we have to start thinking of systematically, toilet construction is a good, good first step, but I'm afraid it's going to create major problems unless we start thinking of how do we manage the septic tanks properly. And it will be very difficult to manage individual septic tanks all over the country with major leakage problem, which as I mentioned, even Canada, US is having even now. So I leave it with you saying basically that water is maybe on an unsustainable path, but the future, if right steps are taken, could be quite bright. And there are some encouraging signs that things are happening. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Professor Pandey. And for any question and answer, I'll be happy to answer any things I discussed or anything I did not discuss. Thank you, sir, for your thought provoking lecture, and it was really very informative. Now, I request Professor Mohanty, you may invite uh, the participant for uh, questions. Please, Professor Mohanty. First of all, thank you, Professor Biswas, for delivering a very exciting lecture on highlighting the current challenges and future solutions of water management in India. Uh, so I right now invite a uh, few questions, like uh, right now we can invite some few questions and uh, Professor Bishwa should be there to uh, answer those. So I invite anyone, if you have any queries or any questions that you can take up right now, please anyone. Okay, so we have one question from Professor Kasi uh, from our department. So, so he is asking particularly about how to manage the extreme recent extreme events of rainfall in India, or maybe in abroad. So this is one of the questions. From the latest study that has come out, uh, I think last week, one of the major studies that has come out that the next generation of people, not only in India, but everywhere, will be witnessing three times more extreme events than we, are, we have witnessed in the past. So it's a, it's a very important question that both extreme rainfall, not only extreme rainfall, <clears throat> but also prolonged drought. How do we hand, handle these extreme hydrological events? Uh, if we look at India's case, most of the rainfall happens in India virtually all within the monsoon, monsoon season. And last time I did some calculations on an average, most of the rainfall happens, the extreme rainfall happens within, if I remember correctly, 80 to 120 hours of, uh, 80, 80 to 120 hours within the year, not consecutive, but 80 to 120 hours. And what happens during this period is you get a tremendous amount of rainfall, which, have, which happens within a small period, which means most of the water is just run away. So both for drought management and, and for managing extreme rainfall, we have to think of all types of storage structures, underground storage, infiltration, small dams, large dams, medium dams, all of these are essential. If, if I again go back to China and compare with India, China last few years has been building large dams left, right, and center. It is now the world's largest dam building and one of the largest produced, by far the largest producer of electric electricity by this. So that will reduce the greenhouse emission from the fossil fuels. So, so we need to manage extreme rainfall. There is no other choice but to do storage structures and manage them. Underground structure, the dams, all types of rainwater harvesting, all types of storage structures, not only to manage extreme rainfall, but also make sure that extreme rainfall stays within the system so that we can use them during the periods of non-rain or extended drought. There's no other choice. 
And one of the problems I see in India is because the current system we have is virtually the dam construction has come to a large dam construction has come to a standstill. Very delayed, costs are going up, and yet we need them urgently. We have enough knowledge now to handle all most of the environmental impacts and resettlement, there shouldn't be any problem. We're seeing that China, each dam they build, they're learning from the mistakes and improving the system. And we can do the same. And, it, and there's, there is no other choice to me but better structure and better management of the structure. Professor Mohanty, may I come? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, please, sir. Uh, Professor Shadajan, you can please ask your question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Professor Vishwas, this is Sharad Jain. It was very nice to hear your lecture, and actually, my question follows the previous question where you emphasize the need for dams. Now, my question is dams help in river regulation, they help in food production, employment generation, and all benefits that you have cited. But despite that, our politicians are not interested in dams or river regulation. So in your opinion, what is the reason and how to overcome this uh, obstacle? That, that is a big problem. The politicians are not, uh, they get worried primarily because the media and some of the NGOs make more noise than we engineers. We have to go, um, my thesis always has been to Take any large dam, look for facts and figures, show it to the politician and show what it can be done and show that this will create uh, one of the things, for example, benefits of the large dam, which we had not thought about before. Uh, I take the Three Gorges Dam. One of the benefits the Three Gorges Dam never considered and has not considered up to now is to what extent intermodal navigation through the Three Gorges Dam has shifted billions of truck journeys on the road and thus create contributing to uh, CO2 emissions, noise, traffic congestion, and accidents. Uh, to the extent the lock of the Three Gorges Dam has now to be doubled and there's no more space because it has been so good, so effective in for navigation that's not been included. I have not seen serious studies of looking at the costs and benefits of the large dams that have been built. Our center in Mexico did one study on, on uh, Bakranangal, which was carried out by Center for Policy Research on the Rangachari which clearly shows the benefits and the costs of the large dams. And how do we bring this knowledge to the media, to some of the pro-development NGOs, so that they can also bring it to the politicians' attention? So that is one problem that we, the engineering profession has not done a very good job in disseminating the costs and benefits of large dams. And this we have to do not writing in the, in the uh, technical papers, th those are essential, but also how do we write it in Times of India or other major newspaper, Indian Express or a few others to show that what have been the benefits and what have been the costs and overall what has been the net benefit to the society. This, I'm afraid, not only in India, but also the rest of the world, we as engineers have not done a very good job in doing what the, uh, what the benefits of dams could be. So that is something uh, I, I remember one discussion by the Indian minister. He wanted to organize a international seminar on rainwater harvesting. And I told him bluntly the dams are also rainwater harvesting. So you cannot talk about the small structure for rainwater harvesting. We have to talk, if you want to talk rainwater harvesting, we have to talk about uh, 
talk about all small dams, large dams, check dams, lot, all types of dams for rainwater and underground structures for rainwater harvesting. And his answer was, I won't say which minister, that PM will not listen to, will not give it a very good, uh, <laughs> very good hearing. And I did not hear any more about this international seminar on, in, on rainwater harvesting, which wanted to emphasize only small, small structure. You cannot solve Delhi's water problem with that type of small structure. Some places, yes, but not, not all, all. So we have to start thinking how to break, how to educate, sensitize our politicians. And this is one of the problems in, in India where the cacophony of sound from the various, uh, various groups drown sometimes the real information and what Donald Trump talks about fake news being preferred than real news. So this will be a big challenge, but unless the politicians get up, only way it will happen will be the next time Delhi runs out of water or, or Bangalore runs out of water or any other big Chennai runs out of water and he's a serious problem or there are some health problems, you will see major politicians jumping on the dam construction bandwidth. But that needs a crisis to change the mindset. And I hope that a crisis will not come because it will cost a great deal of life and suffering to my Indian colleagues. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, so we can take one quick question from Professor Deepak Khare. So Professor Khare, you can may, you may please ask your question. Thank you, sir, for the excellent talk. Just for your information, as you were mentioning about the drinking water supply, I think the Bhubaneswar last month, uh, July end, it became the first city uh, <clears throat> to get 24 by 7 pipe drinking water supply. And they have put 400 uh, water fountains at 400 locations. So that is one thing. And they have completed this project in nine months. So I think this is the first just piece of information. And uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking that when you told about the 30% reduction in China, so what measures they have taken when they have reduced 30% uh, water utilization in, in the agriculture field? One or two main uh, measures which they have taken. Uh, one of the measures they have taken is the pricing of the agricultural water, which I presume will not fly in the Indian political system, irrigation water. So, it, so the farmers have to pay for water and so there is a big incentive for them. For example, one of the things that were uh, the China did the south north south to north water transfer scheme, and for which I advised Deng Xiaoping about his feasibility. Uh, one of the things we're finding out that farmers decided not to take the water for irrigation because the, the cost was was to them was high. So they're starting to use whatever way they can to reduce their water. So so the irrigation water that has not been used by the South North water transfer is before the water was supposed to go up to Tianjin. Now that water is going up to Beijing because there is extra water the farmers did not use because the cost was cost was high. So there is a adjustment within the system but what they are doing is slowly increasing the price of water. So the farmers not only get and realize that water has a cost, it costs them to get the water to them reliably, and they should at least bear part of the cost. Okay. So that has been a major, major effort uh, in China to that, that way. Okay, thank you. Can I have a follow-up question, please? Uh, not a question. If I am allowed to just thank my uh, Professor Piswas, who is the mentor. Oh, Professor Gopala Krishnan, good to see you. It's looking so good. Yeah, no, I was enjoying your lecture and uh, all through so frank, straightforward, uh, hitting the ills in our systems, as well as uh, showing the uh, comparison as to how things could change and have changed, in fact, in smaller systems. And, uh, I have always been 
listening to you and it is so encouraging but one or two things you know uh, contrary to what uh, you try to indicate as to uh, IWRM cannot be a panacea or the river basin authority solution uh, I still wonder that because you know given the a variety of uh, dimensions that we have to address political which you ably brought it out uh, besides now even the intelligentsia through media are trying to play significant part in shaping the policies and you are seeing how difficult even for the center when it comes to the uh, agricultural sector and uh, the agitations that the farmers have undertaken. A country with problems of enormous proportion, even though there is a goodwill centrally or in a whole, whole manner, somehow it takes time, the inertia that we have, we have to overcome. On the rural basin authorities, uh, uh, you know, I was in Nigeria for six and a half years, and uh, it was established around the time I went there in 1977. I stayed up to 83, 84. And uh, it has worked out uh, probably much better. I won't say it is, uh, it has really done wonders. The country had some type of problems uh, which is forever there. And uh, notwithstanding, water has never been an issue of conflicts within the country. It could be many other reasons. Unfortunately, such type of examples available elsewhere has not been gone deeper. And uh, that is a point that uh, we all have to think it out and bring it out. Regarding the rural basin authorities, uh, you see, India, apart from other things, the political aspects you brought out, we have a constitution that people do want to or they keep it in a high pedestal at the same time it has provided so many checks and mates that it doesn't allow any things to move so when it comes to this water you already know that where it is in our indian constitution and to make a progress we have to see how best to do it not impacting the provisions available in the constitution for all players which means union, state, even local bodies, and so on. So uh, the river basin authority solution was taking it, approaching it slightly differently because it not only tries to accommodate the wishes of uh, whatever uh, uh, you know uh, stakeholder groups are there, uh, it tries to slowly march over without affecting the existing systems as it is something that is going to ruin, they all will form part of, more or less it would subsume. So this river basin authority uh, formulation, uh, the government of India did a good thing, right? In 1912-13, it was one of the retired chief justices who headed the panel. I was one of the members. Uh, of course, you mentioned about Pandit. He was in transition, was about to retire at that time and perhaps uh, he would have been an ideal contributor had he been there. We were about four or five, six, uh, three people have passed away. Unfortunately, all of us are getting old. And uh, it brought in experts of different groups, particularly you are also very uh, great contributor. Uh, from the environmental side, you know Das, uh, he was the member in that committee. Similarly, on this agricultural water management, where one of the institutions which has shown success in Maharashtra, we brought in. So we all brought out a very good document. And uh, uh, incidentally, I was the predecessor lecture of this same series, uh, second uh, for this IIT Roorkee's uh, water talk. And in that, I tried to indicate, I, I would uh, kindly request you if time permits, permits to go through and uh, suggest uh, what way uh, it could work or it may not and uh, what way it could amend but because as I understand the government has prepared a sort of bill to be introduced in the parliament and any criticism they may not hesitate to accommodate because uh, uh, 
they are working on the interlinking of rivers. Uh, he classically, you mentioned about South North transfer of water in China, something very similar, but uh, then now taking a different shape because uh, approaching the macro objective in a micro sense and one by one going through. So that is also bringing in the necessity of taking all the stakeholders on board and the states we can, irrespective of the political uh, compulsions, how they can work together. Some of these things probably might be of uh, interest for some of us who want to look at the water sector critically. Well, I have a lot of opportunity to directly interact with you and uh, your large dam book. Uh, I was uh, fortunate also to contribute a chapter. So we will work together and I have no questions. I can't question you. <laughs> and then, uh, it is impossible for me to, I had a lot to learn from you too. We, yeah, I really thank uh, IITR and uh, the organizers in having invited such a great luminary to deliver this lecture this time. Right person. And uh, for the rest of my colleagues in the country, uh, he is, uh, let us acknowledge Professor Biswas was frank, whether it is in Stockholm Water Talk while receiving his water award, Stockholm Water Award, he is frank and uh, he doesn't bother and he doesn't mince us with words and that's the great thing that all of us have to learn we will try hard you gave a very beautiful tips at the end of your lecture and uh, some of us who are still getting some opportunity to interact with government and shape the policies we will try hard to do something thank you sir nice hearing thank you. namaskar thank you. namaskar thank you uh, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a very extensive discussion. Um, I'm really sorry for not being able to take the remaining questions due to strict time constraint. Uh, I right now invite Professor Ajit Chaturvedi, the director, IIT Rurki, to kindly give his address. Uh, please, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Ashish Pandey and the entire faculty of WRDM uh, for inviting me to briefly uh, join this uh, third AN Khosla Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm extremely delighted. In fact, we're honored that somebody as eminent as uh, Professor Asit Biswas has delivered the third AN Khosla Lecture. Uh, it shows that we are able to continue the, with the year after year with the kind of standards that we have set for the speaker of the AN Khosla Lecture. I think uh, today's talk was, uh, was absolutely out there. And um, I wish I could have attended the entire talk to be able to benefit from the uh, lecture of Professor Asit Biswas. Unfortunately, I could not uh, join the talk. Uh, but I must say that uh, due to COVID, these lectures are happening online or, and we are missing out something very important that we could have gained by the visit of Professor Biswas to the campus. In fact, the purpose of these memorial lectures is primary purpose is that eminent people can visit the department and the institute and get to see whatever we are doing. We can hear their advice, their words of wisdom in terms of how we can uh, reorient or reinvent our research areas, topics, uh, what is the kind of steering that is required towards the uh, uh, mentorship of the students, of the faculty, of the department, and in terms of taking up new topics. But uh, this is not happening. So the second best is, of course, that we are able to do these online lectures. But I would like to request Professor Biswas that uh, whenever things become normal, I hope you can uh, visit us physically. I understand that you have visited in the past, uh, but if you can uh, visit us again, Professor Biswas, will that be possible? Yes, most certainly. I visited several times. And in fact, uh, I was an advisor to setting up the for UNDP, the Pollution Control Research Institute in Haridwar, not very far from where you are. Right. So, yes, I've been there quite a few times in Lurki, and as I said at the beginning, uh, I was there in Lurki when Indian Water Resources Society was created, and I was one of the first honorary member of that society. It so, now the department is, is on a big upswing. We got a lot of faculty hired. We have now a lot of focus on, on going beyond the traditional focus of the department was uh, officer training officers uh, from India and abroad. But uh, now we 
we are while we want to continue with that, but we don't want to focus only on that. We are very keen to uh, take up issues like your lecture. I, I read the abstract of a lecture. Those kinds of uh, topics that that we can help the government, that we can help the country at large in terms of shaping the policies, prioritizing what is important because uh, government sitting in Delhi needs people, professionals who can advise them in terms of what is more important, what is less important. And we want to play that role. We are very keen to play that role. And that is why we want uh, researchers, people who have made a mark, uh, they can come and uh, help us and join us in this uh, journey. So, uh, so I re request you that whenever you happen to visit India next, uh, if we can uh, be in your itinerary, uh, we'll be delighted to have you. I understand you're starting on one of your anniversary celebrations. 175th year. Yes. And so perhaps uh, if the things improve next year, I could, uh, I come to, I'm invited to China at least every, I spent at least four or five weeks in China for various advisory reasons. So I'll be happy to come, uh, happy to come, just find, find an occasion to come, come and the situation becomes a little bit more normal. Right. Right, right. I think it's upon Professor Ashish Pandey. He has to take the lead. And, and knowing him, I know that he will take the lead. And sure, sure. the honor of hosting you. Sure, sure. Ashish and I belong to the same IIT alumni, IIT Kharagpur alumni. So <laughs> we, we have a connection that way. You have an emotional connect with him. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So good. So with these words, I convey our thanks to um, Professor Asit Biswas and, and the entire audience and Dr. Gopalakrishnan and uh, all the eminent speakers. I can see Professor Tiwari also has, I can see him in the screen. Namaskar Professor Tiwari. So um, uh, good to see such a wide participation. In fact, uh, I saw a message today from Central Water Commission. They had encouraged uh, uh, as many of their engineers to listen to the talk. Professor Khare is also there and all the colleagues are there. So thank you very much, Professor Pandey. And please continue this good work. Thank you so much, sir. Now, in case all the participants, please put on your video so that we can take your great photo. Please. Professor Mohanty, vote up thanks is with me. Please, please <laughs> invite Professor Kare, please. So thank you very much, Professor Chaturvedi, for the, the nice talk. Now I will invite Professor Deepak Kare to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Please, sir. Thank you, Professor Mohit. So, it's my proud privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks to Professor Asit K. Vishwas, who really delivered a very thought provoking lecture on the most important topic that moving India's water management from unsustainable to a sustainable path, opportunities and challenges. Sir, you have <clears throat> very clearly explained various water management aspects and challenges in India, how sustainable water management is possible in different sectors. You have given very good examples like in domestic sector, how the Cambodia has done in 24 by 7 in by corporative <clears throat> This management in China, how they have reduced the water requirement in agriculture. At the same time, in industries, how the Nestle and this Coca-Cola examples you have given, and how the 2.1 bottle requirement was reduced to 1.3 bottle requirement for one bottle of Coca-Cola. So very nice live examples that you have given. You have really motivated all of us and guided how to make water issue on the main agenda for discussion at decision making forums and policy makers to make sustainable water management. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, I would like to thank Professor Ajit Kumar Chaturvedi, our director, who has always encouraged us to do the various technical activities. 
so just for your information vishwas sir uh, this uh, in fact the he initiated the idea of endowment lecture series by various department in the institute in the name of eminent personalities now we are realizing the impact of his idea really we are able to reach to the eminent persons and get the advantage of their vast experience so thank you <coughs> professor chaturvedi for <coughs> your support and the ideas we are thankful to all our guests and faculty members students from various departments attending this lecture thanks are due to engineer gopal krishna sir also who is alumnus of wrdm iit and delivered the second endowment lecture last year we are thankful to the all the staff and the students of the department of wrdm who have made significantly contributions wholeheartedly for the successful organization of this lecture we are thankful to the media cell of the institute as well as the local and national news <coughs> agencies for giving wide coverage to the event thanks are due to the ministry of jal shakti and central water commission they have taken initiative means they have accepted the request of professor pande and widely circulated this information and so the all the water fraternity could be benefited from this lecture last but not the least we are thankful to one and all those who have directly or indirectly extended their support for successful organization of this memorable lecture thank you namaste jai hind thank you so much sir thank you thank you thank you thank you very much sir professor viswas thank you very much we will still keep in touch sure sir sure sure okay sure, sir. okay sure. all the best thank you so much sir. thank you and stay safe and all of you stay safe and healthy sure yes thank yes. you sir thank you bye bye I think sir, we interacted for more than two hours. We started yes. at two uh, thirty. Now it's uh, around four forty-five. Uh, <laughs> it's yes. already more than two hours. <laughs> yes, it's it. It was in yes. <laughs> it was a good interaction. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Actually, there was time restriction. Otherwise, it is endless. <laughs> People are ready to ask questions. They are curious to know various. Thanks for you. <laughs> yes. yes.